see or buy that. In the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 12, our primary text will start out with this verse 9 today. And I just want to go into it as an introduction this way. You know, everyone, and I speak today as Christians, and uh, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, you're not saved, don't turn me off. Don't shut down. Listen, because it all has application to you as well. Because it's the truth of the Word of God, the truth of the Word of God is what will bring you salvation. The truth of the Word of God is what will keep you and lead you through salvation and to grow as a Christian. For the last couple of weeks we've been looking at, and the texts and the sermons have all been on the subject, really focused in on the grace of God. And just a little recap, the grace of God is how we all got into the family of God. Amen? Amen. The Bible says, by grace through faith are you saved, and not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works. And we've really been trying to dig into and understand the enormous of what grace is, and in that I believe anyone who doesn't know the Lord, if you really come to understand the grace of God, I believe you will be saved. The lady at the well, I remember in the text of John 4, Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God, you would ask. And the reality is most people will not ask because they don't understand. When we talk about salvation, eternal life being a free gift, they just do not understand how free free is. And free is totally, completely without cost. All of it paid for of what Jesus Christ did at the cross when he suffered and died for us. Amen. Now, in the family of God, as Christians, now we come and we say to these who come, and like the, the lady today, being baptized, for everyone, how many are saved today? Let's get started on the right side. All right. Most of the house here are for us. We come into the family by grace. We receive the gift of eternal life by grace. And then we sit out and we begin to live the Christian life. And between here and heaven there is a life to be lived. And God has a purpose for that life. He has duties. He has commands. We are to be changed more and more every day to become more and more like Jesus Christ. We're to love one another. We're to forgive one another. We're to be long-suffering with one another. And long-suffering by its very word means we make each other suffer. Anybody get me that kind of word? <laughs> all right? Long-suffering, patience with each other. We all have our flaws and our faults and our sins, but we're all uncomplete work. But as we begin to live and pursue to be the person God would have us be, knowing these duties and individually things that he would have me do, and the Bible also teaches everybody that comes to God, everyone once you're saved, it tells us that He has a work, a plan individually for you. It literally says that we're His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which He prepared before you were ever saved. So when they say God's got a plan for your life, the scriptures say, Amen. It's true. So when we come then and we look and we have these Christian duties to do, these changes that we know within us that we ought to be doing. And we look and we hear the word of God about the kind of man or woman we ought to be. God calls us for to do that. Now I've come into the family of God by grace and now I see myself and I see the individual will and the duties that God has for me. Second thing, another area of Christian is we move through this life and we begin to try and we will follow the Lord. We begin to find circumstances around us that are very different. Sometimes circumstances really weigh in on us and make things harder than we thought they would ever be. Because after all, children, we're still in a fallen world. And we're still in fallen bodies. I know my biggest challenge today was I had nine back surgeries in 13 years after I got saved. But in all of that, we'll, I may refer to that again, but the point being that when I go into hardship, when I go into difficulty, when I go into circumstances that are hard, maybe you've been born with some defects, some, something that has given you difficulty all of your life. Maybe you're in relationships, or maybe <coughs> children or grandchildren or parents, whatever they are. Just living in East Kentucky, anybody give me on this, can be tough. This is a hard place to live. And that's the reason the ones who usually stick around is us who were born and raised here because their hearts are tied to this place. Because you look around, the financial opportunities are here. 
the things we look around to, and it could be a very, very tough place to make a good living, to get ahead, to hang in here. Why? Something in us, we get dirt between our toes, we never get over it, amen? amen. But be that as a man was saying, the key thing I'm not getting is to conduct it. The key thing I'm talking about now is that as a Christian, we have circumstances that we've got to endure, and God's got to wait for that. We are children of God. We've been blood bought, we've been brought into the family. We exist for his pleasure, the Bible said. So thus he gives me commands, duties, and also circumstances. And as I bear those circumstances, I know what God wants and I want. And that is that I am to bear those in a way where I do not despair, but in fact can glorify God even in the midst of my difficulties, going through the circumstance, surviving the circumstance without losing my faith, coming through on the other side better than when I went in. Now, what's all this got to do with growth? What I want you to understand today is that when we speak of the grace of God, we need the grace of God just as much after we're saved than before we're saved. And when I say grace, it'll be for everybody maybe it's not been here or don't remember. What is grace? Simple word is, meaning, well, the word in the Greek is charis. It means unmerited favor. It means God has given me something I did not earn. That's why we call somebody really kind. Me and uh, Kenneth was talking about my grandmother when he came home. She was a very gracious person because she was always trying to give you something. Kenneth mentioned that. We, I, I tell him, we learned, me and Libby, after a few years, when I went to Mama's house, you don't brag on it. Because if you brag on it, you're taking them home. <laughs> you know? She said, boy, that's a nice place, Mama. Oh, man, get ready. You're not getting out of the house, so you take that place. Every time you go visit, Whatever you say you like, if it's a dish or it's a picture, brother, it is yours, and you're not getting out of there, she's not shut up till you take it with you. So after a while, we just go in there, and all we can do is brag on how good mouth all up, and not brag on anything else. But be that so, what I'm trying to get is the, is the word grace, and it says, by grace are you saved, we're freely saved by the work of God who gives it to us as a gift. And now, what does it mean when we say we come into these circumstances and to live the Christian life because the question is not what I'll be doing. The question always is how in the world am I going to do it? How am I going to do it? And the first text, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Notice in the text what it says. And he, that is Jesus, Paul speaking, said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you. Now what does Jesus mean when he says my grace? Because again, so often we get conditioned to preach to and preach to and preach to and it's true. We are saved by grace, but we only think about the term grace to do with getting into the family. That I receive eternal life, the grip of eternal life by grace. It's unmerited. I don't deserve it. I simply trust God. I call upon Him. When He comes into my life, He gives me what I do not deserve. I deserve damnation. I deserve hell. He gives me eternal life. He gives me heaven to come. I deserve nothing to do with God. He draws near. He gives me His Spirit. He says, I'll live with you. I'll walk with you. I'll talk to you. And then thus ends, we begin that way. We walk in through the door by grace, unmerited favor, and then again we look at the duties and the circumstances and the hardship from which and from where do we get that strength? That's the simple question. And what Jesus is saying in this text and what I want you to understand is this. Christ, when we come to the Lord, this is one of the greatest secrets of God. And it's something, one of the reasons I stayed out of the family of God would not accept the gift of eternal life for over two years. Because as I looked and looked, I did not understand. I knew he was saved. I heard that over and over again. The big question for me always was, well, what if I get saved, what do all these Christians do? They talk about doing this and don't do that. I don't want to do anything. I mean, the stuff you're not supposed to, or the stuff you're supposed to do, and everything they don't want, you're not supposed to do. I don't want to do it. How in the world can I do this? Now, I don't like what I'm doing. I don't like my life. It's all messed up. I'm not happy. I'm not satisfied until I'm guilt ridden and I'm ashamed of it. I've tried to change, and I can't change. And then I watch these church people and they talk about, you know, God and getting saved and doing this and doing that. I'm not like that. What I did not understand is that when we come into the family of God, God freely gives us eternal life. 
but been once in the family of God, the empowerment of Jesus by the power of the Spirit is sufficient for every task, every circumstance. And when I accept Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into my life. The Bible says that he seals me. A simple way of thinking of that is you get the, a seal and mark of ownership. He stamps my heart till the day of redemption. He writes his laws on my heart and gives me an understanding. I don't know everything, but for the first time, everybody uh, that I've ever talked to has got saved can tell you this story. You get saved and then you pick up the Bible and start reading again. What do you find, Christians? It makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> it speaks to you. Why? Because the Word is spiritually discerned. The Spirit comes into your life and you begin to read the Word of God. He begins to teach you. Jesus said that. He said He will guide you into all truth. You look and He'll find, if you can find peace, you can find comfort. But all of these come not because I've earned it, not because I've labored for it. It comes in it by the grace of God. It is freely given. So when the Holy Spirit comes into my life when I'm saved, Christian, He comes to enable me to do the will of God, to bear burdens, to do the task. The Holy Spirit comes to enable me to live the Christian life. Now let me point out to you, He does not come to enable me to watch the Super Bowl. He does not come to enable me to do the dishes. Luke will testify to that. <laughs> he does not come to enable me to watch TV. He comes to enable me to do the will of God. <coughs> so thus, the Holy Spirit comes. And thus, this enablement, if you're looking at this text, and Paul's talking about difficulty, we'll get into this deeper in a moment, but he's saying that, Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. What grace is he talking about? I will freely give to you, Paul, and I will give to every Christian the grace, as he calls it here, not for salvation, but empowering, enabling us to live the Christian life. Now that being so, there's two things I'm going to ask everybody to grab today to get the truth out of what the Word of God is saying. That is first, that when you come into the family of God, your ability to live the Christian life, you're just as dependent then on the grace of God as you were when you received eternal life. And if you, and see, not every Christian accepts that, but if you accept that insufficiency, that weakness, then you can turn from yourself and realize and receive the empowerment that only God can give us to do His will, His way, His time, and to endure any circumstance in a way that would glorify God. So what we're talking about today and what we're at, having for is this. We need to learn and to live the truth. And that is that we're forever crippled to do the things that we think we ought to do as Christians. And we'll be forever crippled until we recognize we can't do it but God can. Because until you recognize that, you will not get your eyes off yourself to get them on the source of all your strength and power, which all comes by grace, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. The best example I know for that is the intersects today, and that's Apostle Paul. Now let me tell you something about Paul. Paul was no armchair, high, ivory tower, seminary teaching theologian. He was no TV preacher. He was no author of books. But let me tell you what kind of man Paul was. He was a Pharisee. He was a persecutor of the church. He had a zeal for God. And Paul, on the road to Damascus, in his pocket, the authority to put to death any Christian he found in that town, he had an encounter with the true living God, revealed to God, the Son, and the person of Jesus Christ. The light strikes him blind. He says, Who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, him whom you are persecuting. Paul was struck blind. The Lord spoke to him on the road that day, and he said, Now, you go. You go on into town and, I, and you're going to learn what I would have you do. He later had someone come to him who the Lord said, Now you go tell Paul because he's going to learn how much he and what he must do and suffer for my sake. You can be a Christian and suffer, friend. Let's talk about your best life now. No, it's a good life. 
But if that's all you've got to say or write a book about, you don't think much of heaven. That's all I'll say first of all, right? And I'll tell you something's wrong in your best life now. The second thing that I'll say about that is, listen, Paul was the guy who God would use to write most of your New Testament. But yet Paul was a guy who was acquainted with difficulty and hardship. He sought to fulfill the will of God in his life. And if you were uh, saved, that's what you want. That's where the victory is. That's where the peace is. That's where the joy is. But there will be difficulty and there will be hardship in the way that you overcome it all by the grace of God. Paul said, listen, my goal in life now, I got all that other stuff lost. My goal is to know Him, the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of His resurrection and the fellowship, to be in fellowship with His suffering. So what does Paul do? Again, not being an armchair theologian, look up here in chapter 12. Look on up in chapter 11. I want you to see something. In chapter 11, just go up a few verses. Now, the context here, Paul, when he's dealing with the Corinthian church, he has some people in the church that were saying Paul's not really an apostle. So that's why you see some of this. He had had people come behind him, called the Judaizers, who tried to question what Paul taught. And you know what? They wanted to question about what Paul taught. And all the stuff, the thing they wanted to attack was grace. As Paul comes speaking and preaching about grace, oh, no, no, no. You have to believe in Jesus, and then you still have to do the Ten Commandments and the Law of Moses and all these things if you want to be right. So when they challenged him that way, and these people who were sitting in Corinth, he sent this by a letter. So here's what he tells them, verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? Talking about those who oppose him, speak ill of him. I speak as a fool. In other words, I'm joking in a sense. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In strikes, above measure. When he says strikes, he's not talking about it only on his sleeve. He's talking about being beaten. He bears it. He says in another place, I bear the marks of Christ on my body. Of strikes, more abundant. Above measure. In prison, more frequent than these other guys. In death or under the threat of death, often. Of the Jews, five times received I forty strikes, say one. Five times an obedient good, godly man for the sake of God was tied to a post and beaten with 39 stripes. Thrice, three times I was beaten with rocks. Once I was stoned. He's talking about a rock, not a earth, okay? <laughs> Once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I was lost in the ocean without a ship. Floating around. In journeys often appears the perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, the Jews, in perils of the heathen, in wilderness, and in perils of the sea, in perils among false brothers, in weariness, painfulness, in watching often, in hunger and in thirst, in fasting often, in cold and naked. That's a description of this apostle's life. Now, I'm not going to get on this subject except to say one thing. Anybody that tells you that the whole Christian life is being taken to the next level, or want you to be the boss, your factor, <coughs> they're not preaching to the Lord God. Paul said, Jesus said, in this world there shall be tribulation. Paul said, all who desire to live a godly life shall suffer. You say, oh man, this is hard. I don't want to hear this. This is the truth. But yet, at all being so, I tell you that I've been lost and I've been saved. And saved is far, far better. Oh, yes. Knowing the Lord, listen, you, one of the greatest lies is only Christians suffer. And I've read this to you, but listen, lost people suffer. <coughs> lost people suffer. They suffer the heartbreak of, of, of addiction, alcoholism. Pride, self-sufficiency, their marriages get destroyed. They suffer. But the difference for us in suffering is we've got someone with us. And we are suffering for a reason. We are following the God of glory, known and revealed through His Son, Jesus Christ. Anybody give me that gift? It's true. So when we suffer, it's not useless. It's not pressed down. And that's why Paul says, I'd rather glory in my suffering. 
Why? Because what is happening here? What is Paul talking about? He's saying, listen, this life, this Christian life, I've been through difficulty. And I've had experiences, but I've also had some wonderful ones. Come on down now to chapter 12. Let's look what he says about himself. Verse 2. He says, I know a man. He's still establishing his credentials. These people say, ah, oh, this apostle Paul is a crazy guy. He's the first to church. Don't pay no attention to that. This is great stuff. Get saved free. Don't pay no attention to that. You need the law of Moses, and you need Jesus too. So he's saying, now listen, they all talk about what they know. Let me tell you what I know. Verse 2, chapter 12. I knew a man, notice he's so modest, Paul, is he doesn't glory in himself. He doesn't say, I, I did. He, he speaks in the third person about himself. He said, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in his body I cannot tell, or whether out of his body I cannot tell. He's saying, God knows. I, I, I had an experience. I don't know if I physically went or just my spirit went. But notice what he says in verse 2. And I was caught up into the third heaven. Third heaven is not a complicated subject for these people at that time. They knew exactly what he's talking about. The view of man in that day, they didn't have this, the mass or any of this stuff, is three things. Where we live today, right now, heaven's both. This is the first heaven. The second heaven is the stars and all that you see. And the third heaven is beyond it, the abode of God. So when he said, I was caught up into the third heaven, they knew exactly what he meant. He said, I went to the place where God is. And what did he see? Verse 3. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. Verse 4. I was caught up into paradise. Remember Jesus told the thief, today you'll be with me in paradise. I was caught up into paradise and heard a speakable word which is not lawful for a man to utter. I heard things that I cannot even tell you what all I saw when I heard the brother I was there. Now, that was his experience. He had something he could brag about. But let me tell you something. It wasn't enough to make him the man that God had to have him be to be used. Everybody thinks if we get an experience, we'll be self-sufficient and we can run the rest of this course and through this life and we'll be exactly the kind of person God will have us be. Hold on. Hold on. Paul had an experience. He was spirit-filled. He had revelations. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. In fact, it was dangerous. It was dangerous because Paul had received something that could, if he was willing to brag, would fill him with self-sufficiency, would fill him with pride. He could say to all these guys, listen, I've been to the third heaven. Let me tell you what I saw. Let me tell you what I heard. God took me there. He took you there. He didn't do that at all. But in the midst of abundance, in the midst of the revelation, Danger. Here's the danger of the God. He can become self sufficient, he can become filled with pride. And here we're Christian. If you're frustrated in your Christian life, one of the things you need to examine yourself about God will not permit pride and self sufficiency to go unchallenged in our lives. You will not lie. Peter did this in 1 Peter, he said, God resists the pride, but he gives grace and power to the humble. You know what the word resist there means? It means to literally fight against. You ever been frustrated? You want to be somebody for the Lord? I've seen this. I've experienced this. I've had personal ambition. You want to do this for you? You want to be somebody for Christ? Listen, ain't one way to get there. Let's just get a handle and say, God will you. So he resists the proud. So what does he do with Paul? And, and this all relates to us. I'm coming, all right, to this. So what does he do with Paul? Look at verse 7. Unless I should be exalted above measure, for that has become filled with pride, self-sufficiency, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, King James, to beat against my body. He is saying now, it didn't come from God, <clears throat> but it was given to me. What does he mean by that? Christian, here's the good news. Nothing can touch you unless God allows you. He is sovereign. There is absolutely nothing can touch my life unless he permits it. Those nine back surgeries, God permitted 
Did he send it? Not necessarily. Who sent this one on fire? Satan sent it. The one who's come, kill, and destroy. He sent it. But absolute anointing of God, Romans 8, 28, he works all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. He says, all right, Satan, I'm going to let you hit him with your best shot. Put the thorn in the flesh. We don't know what the thorn was. I've heard people argue about that and argue about that. They argue about that. If God wanted us to know what the thorn in the flesh was, he told us. All right? All I know is if you got a thorn that's in the flesh, it's going to hurt. So he allows Satan to send this, and now God says, okay, let me show you what I'm going to do. Romans 8, 28, I'm going to take it, and I'm going to use it for good. But I can only use it for good for those who love God. What did Jesus say? Those who love me, obey me. And are called according to his purpose. Are willing to yield it up and say, here, Lord, what is it you're trying to teach me? And thus, what is he teaching you? Notice. He says in verse 8, For this thing I besought or I prayed for three times, that it might depart from me. This guy raised the dead. He did not God. This man, as I said, I think even last week, he invented the prayer cloth. He'd touch a cloth, they'd take the cloth to somebody sick, they'd be healed. And he did not sell. Amen? Jesus said, freely given. You freely received, I'm freely given. He is a guy who walked, he actually was scripture before he walked by some people in his shadow, healed. But when he has his own thorn in the flesh, he prays three times, Lord, take it away, and the Lord says, Why? Because he was going to do, with that pain, with that difficulty, he is going to teach Paul something that Paul could not learn. He was comfortable. He had no trouble. And something that was more important, now get this, more important than his physical well-being. If we had our way, not one of us would ever get sick. We had our way, not one of us could ever have a difficult. Now, I want to tell you something that's bright, that's true, and then you have to look through the source of it and realize that it means that you have a wise, tender God who loves you, that He puts our spiritual maturity above the perfect God. If necessary, He judges need for it. He will allow difficulty to come, and then through that difficulty, He will work His purpose. And that's what is happening here. <coughs> And what he's doing with Paul and what is going to happen is this. The thorn was given. He's going to allow the difficulty to come. And with that difficulty, he's going to teach Paul something that Paul could not learn again only if he was in peace, safety, comfort. And it's something that obviously is very, very vague. And it is, again, these two truths. That the moment you come into the family of God every day that you live within the family of God, you need the grace of God for every task just as much as you needed it to receive salvation. But the other thing is that when you recognize the need, the absolute enabling power of Jesus Christ is there. And the journey to get to that grace and find that strength is recognizing our own insufficiency, our own weakness, because only then, in verse 9, can you realize that my grace is sufficient for you. Now, let me tell you how much and how important all this is. First of all, the important thing God says it. That couldn't make it any more important. Let me stress it this way. Every Christian, every one of us, and I'm not saying this to beat you down. This, I, this, this is trying to lift you up and to get you focused. Because we come into the Christian life, we come in by grace, and then we start hearing all these do's and all. And then we run into super Christians. Everybody run into super Christians. Oh, they're killers in the church. Oh, absolutely. They nearly destroyed me. I've been saved about two years, and I went to a friend's house, and we had a prayer of duty. And all we did was talk. No prayer. But it was a cottage meeting. Well, the college either, for that matter. Now. <laughs> that sounds more dignified. We went to a college meeting for a prayer meeting. Got there. And we'd all been saved us in two, three years. At that point in my life, I was really struggling. A lot of 
Jesus. You know, when you get saved, you think, okay, all these temptations are after them. No. But eventually, some will reappear. Not all of us. Does that mean you sing? No. But it means you can struggle with it. You have to be tempted. And some of the things you thought you'd never think it can be And then you get weary. And, and then deer season comes. <laughs> what am I talking about? Well, I used to deer hunt when I was lost. And we never killed no deer because we never got sober enough to kill We didn't hunt. We drank and we parted. I mean, one thing I found about my relationship there, and all those guys I still love, was once we took the drink and the party and we, we hardly knew each other. We didn't have a reason to be together. But then dear Susan would come, and all my buddies would head off to the I would go, because I didn't really want to go, because I knew what it would be. But after a while, you start sitting around, and one dear Susan, another dear Susan, you start feeling you know, so sorry for saying, anybody been there? Just to bring the fun ones every day. But, I'm so glad y'all came to this. I'll tell you my mind. <laughs> but then, then I go to this cottage meeting, and all these guys start playing super Christian. They all start talking about all the things they never want to do. Never would do again. All the things we used to do. <laughs> oh, man, I'd never do that. Oh, yeah, I'd never do that. You, you, it's like you would have to get them down and tie them to a pole and beat them with a whip to get them to ever even think about doing some of the things we used to do. Now, let me tell you, I left there, and I, you know, the first thought I hear Satan got his interest. He get, got his good one. Am I safe? Did I really get the real right thing? Because these guys are just flying high. No trouble. Man, I'm down here in the trenches. And I'm struggling. It's tough. What's wrong with me? God. I was at a danger point. So I went to the absolute Mecca spiritual spot. They had <laughs> Seriously. My wife, she shot me. There's some things in life you can always count on. The Lord showing up, my wife shot <laughs> And while she shot me, I'm doing my thing. I'm sitting there in the entrance of the Now, this old story. Y'all remember there used to be a Christian bookstore on the left. The so I'm sitting there, and I'm sitting there. And then I finally think, well, I might as well go in that store, see if there's anything in there. I'm sitting there. And walk outside. It's, it, this is all true, and, and, and I'm telling you, it was, a, it, was a, it was a move of God. And I walk down this aisle, and I see this book there written by a fellow in the right hand. His name is Bruce Narrowboy. He had a book there, and it's called Freedom from Guilt. It's the last one they had on the shelf, and it, and it had to be cut. Probably one of these box cuts from him. But just my eyes immediately went to that book. I took it and went out and started flipping through it. And chapter six was Good Old Friends. And I were opening that thing up, and I started reading. And it, he took the book of Galatians, and the bottom line is this he took the verse that I've never really understood. He said, listen, ye who began by faith are you now being perfected by faith. And what I realized for the first time is what he was saying is, look, if you began by faith, the word is grace. Remember I told you that you can take faith and grace to the interchange of the word of God. Because where there's faith, it came by grace. Where there's grace, it came by faith. So when Paul is saying, listen, if you started by grace, <clears throat> or now you're hanging on because of the power of your flesh. And I realize God ain't playing as a Christian. He's dealing with real life. So what I realized then, it, it, it absolutely prevented me from walking away from the faith. But I'll tell you what else it did. It turned my heart very much to the subject of the grace. And when I turned to the subject grace of God and begin to dig and pray and listen. I realize grace is what the whole Christian life is about. I'm saved by grace. I'm kept by grace. And it is so prevalent even I'm going to cut short a moment more to With the Apostle Paul, let me show you 
Well, I had to learn right there that day, sir. And then what we need to learn today. Go back to chapter 12. And here it is. The Apostle Paul, having this experience, coming to that point, now he shows you but what it really means if you will recognize and actually embrace and proclaim from your lips by your heart continually, I am insufficient. I am not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough to live the Christian life. But one, something happens. Now, he gave me four hundred flesh. I prayed three times, take it away. He wouldn't take it away. But here's what he did. He said this. He said, now, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, look at verse 9. So what does Paul come to the point of saying? He says, most gladly, therefore, would I rather glory in my infirmities, my weaknesses. Why? that the power of Christ may rest on me. Verse 10. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities or weaknesses, in reproaches, that struggles and trials, in necessities, hardship, in persecution, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For God taught me this. For when I'm weak, brother, then I'm strong. When I realize I can't do it, when I lay aside any pretense that I'm the man that's got the place, when I say, God, I am unable, in those circumstances, when I get out of the way, get my focus off myself, get my focus on the Lord, then I realize what God is saying is, Paul, let me tell you, when you get weak, then I get strong. Is it true, church? And we falter and we fail at this point time and time again because church life stresses to us, it seems, continually. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. We're always looking for somebody that's smart enough, somebody's got a plan. Listen, when it's all said and done, I am saved by grace. And then I live by grace. When I look at my inadequacies, inadequacies my inabilities, it doesn't drive me down. Brother, it gets me focused so I can look up and yield to the power of God. Does that make sense to you, Charlie? Yes. It's the truth. And it's one of the keys to living the Christian life. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to them. Now that's the God of the Bible. And we call the gospel the good news. Listen, it's still good. But praise God, to our shame, it's still me. It's still me. We come into the church. What keeps us out is our self-sufficiency, my self-righteousness. Okay? And then when I'm stepped through the door and become a member of the church, I just take that pride, flip it over, now it's no longer self-righteousness, it's self-sufficiency. Oh, I can do it. No. You're not going anywhere with the Lord. You're not going anywhere and you can use the Lord. Do you recognize it's not about you? It's not about your ability. It's not about your strengths. It's not about your talents. It's all about him. For unless, you know, we know these verses. For unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. We struggle, we try, we use the weak in the hand. And all we're doing is excluding. What I want you to do about this, what God would have to do about that, and that is Christian here is to, here's the pattern. The strength you want. Every day to recognize you're not sufficient. You're not able. But that's not to shame you. That's to focus you. So as you begin every task, you look somebody that okay. How many 
I know you're waiting, I'm, I'm going to write you something, aren't you? But I could go on, I'll let that have a sermon. Let me tell you something. I said, I really am. But think about this one. Here's one of the signs of self sufficiency. Watch this, not the way I am. Christians say that often. You know, you need to forgive that wrong. I know that wrong, but I'm just, that's just not the way I am. What are you saying? First of all, you're telling the truth. That is not the way you are. But you're not finishing the sentence. Oh, I can't do that. I don't, I, I don't have any vision in that area. I don't have that ability. Oh, I can't. That's right. That's the first step. I take the next step. But I can't. Because as long as you stop where I can, all you've done is strip yourself of any effort, and you think stripping yourself of any responsibility. But you're not taking the next step that to be enabled by that mission. And that is, I can't. <coughs> but God's grace is sufficient. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's when I look at that brother and I can't forgive him. I can go to my God and I can say, my God. I can't do this. Lord, you tell me you've written your laws in my heart. And you tell me that I was powerful. <coughs> Self-sufficiency is the way of this world. Self-sufficiency is the only sense of security in this world. You've got to have the job. You've got to have the money. You've got to have this. You've got to have that. But within the family of God, living as a Christian, self-sufficiency is the pathway that weakens, frustration, constant failure. Because you will find over and over again, you can But if you embrace that truth and then take the next step, and it is believe and take God in His Word, where He says, Now my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. My grace is sufficient for you, child. Take Jesus at His Word. He said, He who puts His trust in me will never be put to shame. Seize that. Pray the prayer, continue. Every morning, every night, every text, Lord, I can't, but you can't now. Give me the strength. I'll step out to do it in your strength. Your honesty, day by day, you'll shake, you change more and more. Kind of man, I'm on the faith. It's thoroughly good. Now, let me say also now to those who do not believe, or are not sure. You've stayed out of public confession. You've stayed out of church. You've stayed away mainly because of one reason. If you're that person, there's so many. You keep looking at the church and you doubt if you are able. Not doubting that God will save you, but if you just don't think that you can live the Christian life. But well, here's the news. You can't. But God will that fear of self-sufficiency, that not only that fear of death, relying on yourself, waiting to even trust yourself enough to come to God. It's totally contrary to grace and faith in God. What you need to do today is step past that fear. You say, well, there's a lot I don't understand. That's true. 
All of us are learning. Did you start where you want? Do you believe in Jesus somewhere? Do you believe he died and paid the price for your sin? Do you believe he'll do exactly what he says? He says, if you'll come, if you trust me, I'll save you. If you call upon my name, I'll save you. Do you believe the rest? So he says, now, come. 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 With you every hour of every day. And no matter what task lays before you, no matter what the circumstance, you can endure, you can fulfill. All in the way that blesses you and glorifies me, but you don't do it by your mind, you do it by your mind. Would you come today? Let's start right here. For who once never trusted God, today you want. that I'm a sinner. Lord, I ask you now forgive me of every sin. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Lord, come and live in my heart. There's a lot I don't know. A lot I don't understand. There's things you'd have me do I know I can't do. But Lord, today I'm willing. I'm willing to do. I'm willing to learn. turning around and I'm asking now in April, I trust you to save me. I trust you to change me. I trust you to lead me day by day. To be the person that I am. And I ask you to do all this. Not because of more. Because you're that good. That's in Jesus' name I pray. I pray that today.